Once upon a time, I lived off of Lake Michigan. Actually, I lived within walking distance of the beachfront. And one of my favorite ways to get to this beach was down a dirt and gravel road that was at one point supposed to be a road that connected the beach to the main road that went through this dinky little town. However, for some reason, the funding got pulled and it just became this dirt and gravel path that the locals would walk down whenever they had nothing better to do in this dinky little podunk town in the Midwest. And it was one of those days where I had nothing better to do in this dinky little podunk town in the Midwest where myself and one of my friends got up and we decided to walk down this way because it was the first 60 degree day of that year. The thing is, for the month previous, it had been in the 20s and the 30s, so what we didn't expect was the fog. This dense, thick fog that encompassed everything. Once we reached this trail, we could not see five yards ahead of us or five yards behind us, and there was thick, dense woods on either side of the trail that we couldn't see through. Not that we normally could, but it was especially difficult in this current story. As we were walking forward, the anxiety started to get to us. We knew this path. We knew this area. It was very familiar to us. And yet, for some reason, it started to seem increasingly more uncanny. Something about the fog covering everything made everything seem uncertain, as if something was going to lunge out of the fog at us, or as if something that we couldn't discern was going to cross the trail ahead of us or behind us. Or perhaps there was going to be something following us that we just couldn't tell what it was, nor could we see, but possibly we could hear. As we get closer to the beach, we start to hear the waves, and for the most part, it seemed normal, but it seemed like the waves were being obstructed by something. Eventually, as our anxiety was reaching critical mass, we would find relief by reaching the beach that we had been very familiar with, as it was the one that we frequented the most. However, upon arriving, something was just a little bit different. And that was the lake being completely covered with a sheet of ice that somehow, some way, had been broken up into hexagonal chunks that now looked more like scales across the top of the lake. And the waves that we were hearing were the waves underneath this sheet of ice that was making these hexagonal chunks of ice move in and out. And there was something calming and serene, and yet it still seemed very foreign and alien, something we were very familiar with, now all of a sudden was almost unrecognizable, or almost like a not quite accurate rendition, because normally when we would go to the beach, we would be able to go and look out into the horizon, but this time it was nothing but fog and ice, and it felt like we were unable to be detected, which brought a sense of comfort, but at the same time, an ominous air loomed over us that was as palpable as the fog itself. And then the fog cleared up as soon as we decided to leave and find our way back home. And that's the only real point of this story, is to have a fun, neat little story that I feel is incredibly fitting for the video that I am starting here. Because we're going to be talking about liminality. In the last year and a half, I've gotten very comfortable and accustomed to a type of video on this platform where people are talking about liminality and liminal space imagery. And although a lot of them wind up meeting and fitting the same beats, every creator winds up having their own different take on it, their own different spin, something else that they bring to the table, even though they look almost a dime a dozen. But in this unique situation, it's like it doesn't really matter that they feel different because they feel the same. And it's in their sameness that they're able to deliver something new. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do here. And the new thing that I'm trying to introduce is the concept of magic through the goddess Hikati, who is positioned right over here at the bottom. Because most times when we start learning about Hikati, 
she's presented as the goddess of witches and witchcraft and magic and sorcery and necromancy. But she is only these things because she was the goddess of liminality first. And it makes perfect sense to me personally how, over the course of the last several years, liminality and magic are the two things that I like to talk about the most. Concepts that I keep revisiting. Things that are just so a part of what I do in my own worldview and philosophy that it's hard not to talk about them. Now, for those of you who are on the fence at this point, wondering if I'm going to get too carried away with magic and look like every other run-in-the-mill witch talker, that's not what I'm trying to do. Though I would be able to forgive you if that's the way that it comes across to you or others. But what I am trying to do is make a video about liminality, and I'm going to talk about liminality first. And as I go along, I'm going to insert where Hakati fits into it. And for the most part, I do intend to share some of the same regurgitated points that almost every other video on liminality brings up at some point throughout the course of that video essay or just whatever type of video you want to call it. Because there's a lot to work with here, and there's a lot of jumping points to utilize and move through, but with any luck, perhaps I can put my own spin on it and make people see both liminality, and magic from possibly a completely different point of view if you have not already thought of it in these ways before. Now with that being said, I would like to move on with the video, first starting with a very important question. What is liminality? Right, hang on, I've got my notes somewhere over... Here we go. Liminality, from the Latin limen or threshold, the quality of disorientation from the ambiguity that occurs in the middle stages of a rite of passage. Wow, that is so incredibly vague and so vague that it might not even make a whole lot of sense to people that are familiar with liminality through what people have been saying about it online, so let's get into it. Now, this particular positioning of the concept of liminality may not have started with, but was made much more popular by a paper written by... Victor Turner in the 20th century titled Betwixt and Between. So there are a lot of things that I'm going to scrape from the surface of that paper to present here to give us a framework of understanding. In order to try and do any kind of justice to this concept, we first need to start with our point A and our point B. This is from the start of an experience to the consummation or the culmination of that experience. And how we get here, everything that is in between is the limin or the margin. Liminality occurs when we are in this transitional point in between when all we have is what was, what has yet to be, and we are experiencing everything that is in the middle. It is the things that take place in this middle point, the in-between, the threshold, the margin, the middle ground, where things have yet to become what they are going to be and are no longer what they once were, that transition, metamorphosis, change, and even some sort of spiritual alchemy may be able to take place to get somebody to grow in one way or another as a person within themselves. Now I'm going to bring up another point that winds up being a part of the usual adages in these conversations about liminality, which is puberty. Something that is, at least for the most part, universal, because either you are going to, you already have, or you are in the process of that experience. You start off as a child. By the end of it, you are an adult. And in between is a state of constant changing and fluctuation where your body is changing, your personality is changing, everything about you is changing. In a short period of time, from point A to point B, puberty is what happens in the middle. Another thing that might not be personally experiential to all of us, but I'm sure we have a concept of, at least in some point, is metamorphosis. Let's use either a moth or a butterfly for the example. The thing starts off as a larva. 
and then it goes into a cocoon. And when it emerges from that cocoon, it is now either a butterfly or a moth. The liminal point would be what happens when that larva is in the cocoon, turning into a gooey substance. That way, everything inside of the cocoon can change and then be rearranged and emerge as a butterfly or a moth. Now, with this fun little diagram here that is referenced all the time and is incredibly useful to help people understand and get to a point, I wondered to myself, what would the inverse of this look like while at the same time still get the same point across? And then I realized, I already have an example. This is a crudely and frankly poorly drawn diagram of a three-ray crossroads. In ancient Greece, many of the crossroads were actually three ways exactly like this. You have at the ends of any of these roads where you had come from. In the middle, all points converge into a liminal in-between place where they are simultaneously all of the things that they were but no longer are any of the things that they are. And in this space, they are all and none of those things. And it was at this middle point where an effigy of Hecate was placed, where people who were travelers, wanderers, vagabonds, merchants, all types of people would be wandering these crossroads and I would either get lost or turn around or they were just wandering to begin with and they would lay out offering or send a prayer to Hikati that way they could help them along the trail when they were getting from point A to point B in their own liminal travel. I honestly personally think that this here is an incredible diagram and example you know, we don't need Hakati to be in the center, but it still gets all of the same points across. However, instead of being in an ongoing thing, it presents options. And it also demonstrates that we may not have all come from the same places in our journey and yet still meet somewhere in the middle. We have what was and what will be having yet to come to fruition before it moves on to the next thing. But when we are talking about the experience of liminality, this is something that isn't easily explained or quantified into easy words. It is something that we can talk about and then by some kind of shared experience go ahead and say, hey, yeah, that's the feeling that I'm talking about. And because liminal states are almost universal for most of us, it's something that we can wind up talking about. And I think it is in this transient quality where there isn't a set fixed definition and there are multiple different examples is exactly why this conversation about liminality and liminal imagery and liminal periods can continue to grow and evolve and we can continue to overlook it and look at it from a different perspective and learn something about it that we didn't know before or we can posit something new entirely. Which is not what I'm going to do for the next part of the video because I am going to bring up the idea that has been brought up time and again, and that is another good example of liminal experience is when staying at a hotel. Hotels are temporary places where people can go and rent a room for room and board for a temporary time while either they are away from their point A and getting to their point B, or it is a place that they are staying for a while in between point A and point B. Now, as somebody who has both worked in the industry and lived in a hotel in order to avoid living on the street, some of those things happening simultaneously, I can say, yeah, there's something to be said here about that. I worked at a popular hotel establishment that for the potential ramifications of legal reasons, I'm not going to say where exactly it was I worked, but let's just say sometimes the lights do get turned off. We just hope you're not looking. And this particular hospitality establishment was spooky as shit. Now, when I first started working there, I was informed by management that there were a number of 
perishings that had taken place there. Typically from uh, too much to consume of something in one night, never really anything terribly violent, but that it had happened. And then I was instantly warned that some people are not going to want to stay in room 247. 247 was the in the second building in the second floor, all the way in the back, all the way in the corner. It was literally the last room numbered in the building. And now, as I started working there and climbed my way up to a management position myself over the course of three years working there, I had a lot of people coming to me and telling me either they wanted their money back or they wanted to specifically rent out room 247 because it was spooky or something uncanny happened in that room or something just made them uncomfortable and they didn't like it. Or because it was uncomfortable, that's exactly why they did like it. And they wanted to bring friends to sit and have some kind of paranormal experience. Now, even though I myself am a believer in the magical and the paranormal, I started off in paranormal investigation, which for my own personal background and the way that I was taught and learned, you want to debunk things before assuming things. You want to rule everything else out before you assume that it's something paranormal, which fits in with the adage popular in witchy and occult circles, mundane before magic. So I'm not sure if there was actually anything paranormal going on there, or if it was just the element of liminality seeping into the subconscious of the guests, and now they were seeing things happen or having an uncanny experience because the hotel was being a hotel. Let's think of it this way. You enter into the hotel and you get everything set up for yourself and you're intending to lay down and relax or you're just unloading your shit so you can go on and do the next thing. The room that you have been allotted is all the way at the end of the hall into another building, all the way down at the end of that hall just to go up and into the last room on the right. I wish it was on the left, that would have been more cooler, that would have been more thematic, but it was on the right. And what you as a guest don't know is that the maintenance room is directly across the hall from you and one of the pool filter regulation units is in the room across the hall from you on the floor below you. So there's going to be all kinds of spooky noises. There's going to be all kinds of things heard in the walls, in the pipes, that you're hearing and not understanding its origin. And at the same time, you already are in the room, farthest away from the desk, farthest away from some kind of safety or aid to come to be lent to you. And on top of that, you gotta walk down these hallways to get all the way back to that front. And to get back to your room, you gotta go down all these hallways where it's just a stretch of hallway moving forward. And the same doors are repeating on either side. And the only difference is that there is a different number on either one. The same carpet, the same walls, the same lights going, stretching on, moving forward. And it's actually having an effect because you gotta go from the farthest point to the farthest point if you're going from the front or to the back. I don't know if this was paranormal at all, or it was purely psychological. And this is something that happens when we are either majorly or minorly experiencing something that is of a direct liminal experience. Ah, nothing like a good spooky story for me to want to come outside and change the scenery. And I would personally like to start by pointing out a dagger. In modern witchcraft, this may also be referred to as an athame, depending on the way in which you're using it. This is also an important tool of the goddess of liminality, Hecate. 
In many instances, Hecate is referred to as a goddess of both life and death. That doesn't necessarily mean that she has direct governance over either thing. However, depending on the resource you're pulling from, she may very well be doing exactly either of those things, if not both. But the reason I bring up Hecate and the dagger is because we see in Hesiod's Theogony that Zeus gave Hecate the epithet of Kortrophos or Kortrope, which means nurse of the young, something that in today's day and age we might call a midwife. She was a part of the process of the delivery in childbirth, because oftentimes this childbirth delivery would happen in the home, and because Hestia was the goddess of hearth and home, she was the one that was prayed to during the process. However, Hecate wound up lending a helping hand, and it was the dagger that was the tool to sever the umbilical cord, severing the connection between mother and child. And then to further this notion, it is often said that Hecate uses the same dagger in order to sever a person's soul from their body upon the moment of being deceased. She brings you into this world, and she helps take you out of this world. I feel that's a little bit on the nose, and that is a direct way we can explain this. However, in ancient Greek religion, once a person passes on, their journey doesn't end there. We have this whole thing set up called the Underworld, or the Realm of Hades, or Kingdom Catonios, whatever you want to refer it as. There's a whole King Hades and a whole Queen Persephone who rule and govern those who have now passed on. Some didn't always make it to the kingdom, and therefore were stuck here on Earth, wandering the Earth plane in an in-between space between having died and reaching their final destination. And for this, they are stuck, ghosts, unrest spirits, in a liminal place between life and death. So the spirits of the unrest dead existing in this in-between space, this liminal existence between life and death, is exactly what grants Akati governance over those spirits. Sometimes she can find them and help them move on or carry them to the underworld or to care on the ferryman who takes you to the kingdom on either, depending on the resource, the river Styx or the river Acheron. Hecate is deeply associated with the unrest dead and with ghosts. There are even some instances where an unrest spirit now in the care of Hecate chooses not to move on and instead will become a part of Hecate's menagerie of unrest spirits that she brings with her in tow. This is also why Hecate is oftentimes referred to as the goddess of necromancers and mediums, because whether you are utilizing magic to bind command or help the dead move on, or you are using mediumship in order to hold conversation with the dead, that medium, you yourself, or the magic that you're utilizing, is traversing into the liminal realm in order to do something with the unrest dead who are now in that in-between liminal space. And that doesn't stop there. People who use divination are utilizing themselves or their divining tool, whether that be pendulum or tarot cards, oracle cards, or even Ouija boards, because you are existing in the physical world and you are using some type of tool or implement in order to divine information from the other side. Either you or your tool is the medium, the liminal point, the focal point in which the bridge between this realm and the realm of the dead crosses over. And it all comes back to ghosts and Hikati and ghost stories being the stuff of liminality. All right, now, where exactly did I leave off? All right, hotels. That means the next part of the video... <laughs> We're going to talk about The Shining. Now, I am not the first person, nor am I going to be the last, who is going to bring up The Shining in regards to the topic of liminality. But I think the reason why this 
movie keeps getting brought up on this topic is because it does really well to utilize hotels to invoke the feeling of liminality while layering all of the horror on top of and inside of it. Stanley Kubrick's The Sh Stanley Kubrick's The Shining is a movie adaptation of a Stephen King novel. Famously, Stephen King was quite dissatisfied with the way that the movie came out, even being quoted as saying, The Shining is a movie made to hurt people. And I, like many others, will suggest, I think that's kind of the point. Now let's face it, Stanley Kubrick was kind of a dick, and by today's standards would probably be considered to be at least a little bit problematic. And we can see this in the stories of what came of the production from on set. Kubrick being tasked with turning one of Stephen King's most famous novels into a movie, he also wanted to make an excellent piece of cinema. And in order to do this, he would make the actors, particularly Shelley Duvall and Jack Nicholson, do takes over and over and over and over until they were at their wits end. That way he can get a natural, raw take that really captured the delirium of being stuck in the Overlook Hotel. For those of you who are unfamiliar with the story of The Shining, we follow Jack Torrance and his family as Jack gets a job at a hotel where they're going to be the only ones there for a certain period of time. We watch Jack get the job and we follow as him and his family, being his wife Wendy and their child Danny, move into this hotel. And while they're there, isolated from everyone else, things go sideways and south real quick as the things that haunt the hotel are driving the family to be torn apart and utilizing Jack to do incredible harm to his family. Throughout the movie, we are watching as Wendy isn't sure what is going on with her husband or her child, and her child having this undiagnosed psychic ability to see the ghosts that are in the hotel that are afflicting her husband as he descends into increasing madness trying to do his job while trying to be a writer at the same time in this isolated hotel that is set up to have almost unending hallways, or in the very least, we never see the end of the hallways unless Danny or somebody is turning to see another nigh endless hallway. And the main room is open with vaulted ceilings and we're never really able to see around the corner vast open stairways that lead upstairs that make you wonder what is around the corner as these people are being afflicted by the things going on in the hotel it leaves us to wonder what is actually going on. And even though things do escalate with the present threat of both the paranormal entities and Jack Torrance, what really makes the movie so terrifying is the implication of violence. The threats are established to be very present, but it utilizes the idea of the hotel, not knowing what's around the corner, trying to run down the hallway, not having a lot of room or space to get away from what's going on, and being closed into a confined space. That really makes the anxiety of this liminal presentation that much more terrifying. And I think that there are a couple of points that I'm trying to get at with all of this. First of all, I do believe that the movie was made intending to hurt people. I think that was the point. And secondly, Stanley Kubrick made a movie based on a novel by Stephen King. Two completely different mediums to invoke and evoke horror. So, through the medium of novel writing, The Shining works absolutely perfect for that. In the medium of horror filmmaking, The Shining is a perfect version of that. And I want to rip off Super Eyepatch Wolf, let's face it, by pointing out that there is a directed 
TV version of The Shining that is a much more faithful adaptation of the book, but it doesn't elicit the same kind of terror the way that Stanley Kubrick's The Shining does. Which brings me to two points. One, I believe that Stanley Kubrick was doing what he was doing and was completely aware and utilized both the medium of filmmaking as well as the location of a hotel to elicit and invoke the feelings that are within all of us that make us feel uncomfortable in a prolonged period living in a hotel. And number two, just because it's a movie and just because it's in a hotel doesn't mean it's going to be scary. But there is something to point out about hotels that whether it's in a movie, in a novel, or in your own direct first-hand experience, if the hotel is properly mystified and left in an unknowing in just the right way, it can make us feel incredibly uncomfortable and even come to the hotel desk clerks to say, any room is good other than room 247. And something that I realized in the process of my filming this part of the video is that the hotel that I used to work at, the no-no room was 247. There is a famous documentary about The Shining called Room 237. And when Stephen King wrote The Shining, he was stay staying at the Stanley Hotel in Colorado in room 217. Swear to God, I didn't do it on purpose. Holy shit. Nothing really special to point out there, just small little coincidences. Maybe there's something liminal about numbers that start with two and end with seven. Now that's a topic for another time. Oh boy. Pardon the change in scenery. Today, the day that I'm filming this anyhow, is April 8th. 2024, which is the day of the solar eclipse. And I figured a change in setting would be good based on where we're going next in the video. Cause I think it's not necessarily entirely fair that if I'm going to regurgitate and rip off several other different content creators and the points that they made in their own videos that I don't bring up liminal space imagery. A lot of liminal space imagery will look something like this. It takes something that we are familiar with, but it removes all of the people that are normally there. And without the distraction of other people, it seems a little foreign and uncanny. And in that uncanniness, it gives this ominous ambiguity. Oftentimes, the types of pictures that we see in liminal space images will be shopping malls, basements, living rooms, things that a lot of people, at least in the West, have this common, nigh-universal familiarity with. Now, I want you to take a look at this image real close. Does this look familiar to you? Have you been to this mall before? Perhaps you've seen this image before. Well, the interesting thing about it is, unless you follow me on TikTok or on Instagram, there's a good chance that you haven't seen it before. Well, unless somebody snagged it and put it into circulation, at which point that's fucking awesome, but I'm unaware of it, which is cool, honestly. But, I don't know this image to be popular, because I took this picture at a mall that I live nearby. And not to say that other malls aren't similar. In fact, I think it is in these similar things that make liminal spaces so liminal. Liminal space imagery has a habit of invoking a sense of familiarity, almost as if we've been here before. And I think it's worth pointing out that a lot of these liminal space images are of places that many of us have been before. In other words, I feel that the success and popularity of liminal space imagery has a lot to do with the fact that it's playing at our collective nostalgia. Now, nostalgia in and of itself is a very bittersweet thing. Most often instances of nostalgia, you're remembering something that was a good feeling. Sometimes you remember something that was a bad feeling. 
And there's a bittersweet quality to the good memories because even though it reminds us and takes us back there, there's a grieving in it because we're not going to be able to relive it or repeat it again. Or from the opposite direction with the bad memories. We can remember them and they can be very unsettling and uncomfy, but there is a relief in knowing and reminding ourselves that we're not there anymore and that's not where we're existing. Now, the thing about nostalgia is this is a feeling that is invoked by the emotions that come from remembering something. Now, there are some memories that we have that we can remember clear as day, crystal clear, as if it had just happened. But what about the memories that are further away from our present moment? If you are an adult, odds are it's not entirely easy to remember things from our childhood as if it had just happened. The further we get away from a memory, the less clear it can become. The less stark of a reality a memory is, the further we are away and in now our present reality. In other words, memories have a habit of being faulty. Now, I want to bring up here the idea of the Mandela Effect. This theory that takes a look at this phenomenon where we wind up remembering things differently than others. We recall something from the past one way, and we, when we are proven with that thing being inaccurate, it's a little confusing. We try to figure out why this is. And a lot of people have come to the conclusion that the way that this is explained is by the fact that multiple different realities have collided into one another, or we're remembering a different reality because we are now living in a different one, or something like that. Now, this is a whole bunch of complex thinking, when it can be explained by something called memory conformity. When we are looking at something in the past, those memories have a habit of being faulty. So when we collectively recall something inaccurately, it makes it feel like that inaccurate memory actually happened. Take, for example, Nutty Bars. You might be thinking, are you talking about Nutty Buddy? No, I'm talking about Nutty Bars, the Little Debbie Peanut Butter and Chocolate Wafers. A lot of people have suggested that this is a Mandela Effect. But I remember being a child, arguing with people, holding up the box and saying, no, it's a Nutty Bar. And then, without announcing it, the company changed the name to Nutty Buddy. And it made everybody all up in a tizzy about the Mandela Effect. That's not... Mandela, or anything of that effect. It's people in that time already were referring to it inaccurately. So they carried that memory with them into the future. And then, behind the scenes, without announcing it, the company changed the name. But at one point, it was Nutty Bar. And this is only able to happen because of something called memory conformity which is only possible because our memories, when we go far back enough, aren't always reliable. Now, before moving on, there is another phenomenon that I want to bring up, and that is called pareidolia. This is something that happens to pretty much everybody when we see something that isn't a face. But for whatever reason, it kind of resembles a face. We know it's not a face, but it looks like a face. This is something that the mind does because it's trying to make sense of things and sometimes there isn't sense to be made in what exactly we are seeing. So there is something that very vaguely or slightly resembles a face. Our mind is going to tell us it looks like a face, even if we can completely and rationally logic it away and say, no, that's not a face, that's a vape cloud. So now that I presented the idea that sometimes our memories aren't always reliable. And our brains do this thing where we're trying to make sense of the thing that we are seeing and trying to place it properly, even if it doesn't quite fit. What happens when we are presented with an image that kind of alludes to a memory 
that is similar to something that we've experienced before, and now our mind is trying to place it, but no matter how hard our mind is trying to place it, it doesn't quite fit. I think this is exactly what's happening with a lot of liminal space and imagery and why it's so appealing to such a wide audience. Now, I want to present another image real quick, and that would be this one. A black and white image of a beach. Now, many of us have been to a beach before, or in the very least, we've seen a picture of a beach. However, on one side, we have the beach and the water. On the other side, we have dry land. But because of the way that the image is taken, the bricks, the blocks that are there are leading sort of toward a vanishing point. And at the end of that vanishing point is a building that's just a little off center and a tree that's just a little bit going over from one side to the other. And now with that familiarity, it starts to feel familiar or in the very least pleasant. Or maybe it's a little uncanny. Who knows? But now on top of that, there's no color in it. So now our mind is trying to fill in the color, or in the very least, we're already starting to kind of infer what the color of this image would be. Because our brain is trying to make sense of it and fill in the blanks. All of these things together make it feel familiar and uncanny. And there's a little bit of a comfort in that. But at the same time, it can be a little ominous. I took that picture the day before I moved away from my hometown. And it is also the beach that I was walking to in the story at the beginning of this video. It's also the image that I use here on YouTube as the channel banner and it is the image that I use for the end screens of almost every single one of my videos that I put up here. In other words, I've been making liminal space imagery since before it was cool. So now I guess what I'm going to ask is, what have we established so far? We have established that liminality is referring to the experience that is oftentimes very ominous, ambiguous, and uncanny, where it alludes to something that usually is in line with something that's nigh universal, or in the very least, familiar enough that enough people can get behind it and be spooked out and creeped out by it. It is a feeling that arises when we have departed from point A and there's not really a way of going back. And we're not exactly certain how we're going to get to point B, or even if there is a point B that we can find safety in once we get there at all. And some of these liminal spaces are landing points in between point A and point B that are temporary transitory spaces that multiple people can collect in and either shop around or enjoy television together. And because of that nostalgia, it invokes a universal sort of uncomfiness that we can all talk about and we can all find some way to relate to. Now let's think about it. What else could this be explaining? What other things as a collective experience does this vaguely describe? Sleeping and dreaming. Let's think of it this way. When we lay our head down at night, we are preparing to depart from the land of the waking. And we are going to enter the land of the dreaming. But that's not the destination. Waking up is the destination. Now, unless you are somebody who either can't remember your dreams or is incapable of dreaming, dreams are something that happen in between going to sleep and waking up. And oftentimes when we enter the dream, we're just there. We're not really thinking about how we got there. We're not really cognizant of how we got there. And sometimes we would become aware of the fact that we are sleeping and realize that we are dreaming, at which point we either wake up or the dream becomes lucid. But if that doesn't happen, the dream is just going to end. And it is in these dreams that 
oftentimes wind up in hindsight feeling like a simulation of real life, where things are mostly correct, but not quite. Or there's a chance that the dream can become entirely unhinged and either fantastical and whimsical or completely the stuff of eldritch terrors. Dreams also take place when we are asleep, a time when, although we are alive, by the fact that we aren't awake, we aren't actually engaging in our day-to-day -day life. We're asleep. And when we are asleep, these dreams wind up being simulations or replications of places that we've been to before, malls that we frequented as children, places that we've dreamed of going, things that we have seen on television or on the internet. They are familiar enough to give us that sleep-induced suspension of disbelief, something to get by and play something out. When we leave waking state, we enter dreaming state. And that dreaming state is in between waking and sleeping. It is in between living and not quite living. Are you seeing what I'm getting at here? Dreams are the ultimate, if not the original liminal experience. But what happens if you're dreaming and you can't wake up? What happens if you're aware that you're dreaming and you can't take control of it? Or what do you do when you can't tell if you are awake or you are asleep, but the experience that you're having is so removed from anything that you've experienced before that the uncanny overtakes you and now you're living a nightmare. This is what I personally refer to as liminal hell and I've got a perfect example. The movie Skinamarink is the perfect example of what I'm getting at. The movie Skinamarink follows two children as they are left at home alone with no adults present because it appears that they are just completely isolated for reasons that aren't really addressed in the movie. That would be one thing on its own, but the way that the film is shot is that it uses really unique unconventional and obscure angles to capture the things that are going on. Not only that, there are very low quality shots and extended periods throughout the movie where there's little to no sound going on at all, and what we can hear is just the dull, ambiguous silence of not knowing what's going on. So on top of the way that the movie has been shot and the way that the scenes are set up that these two kids are alone, there's an entity in the house that is terrorizing them. At first, indirectly, by changing the layout of the house. And then, directly, by affecting the things that grant people basic human dignity, such as the bathroom, the toilet just disappears. And by the end of the movie, one of the children disappears and the other kid is directly harmed. It doesn't really explain how they got into this situation and it doesn't really give an entire end-all be-all conclusion as to how they get out. And the entire time the movie invokes a feeling of dread and things that are just a little uncanny and an entity that is barely visible, but is affecting the way that they are able to do things in their day-to-day -day lives now that they are removed from anything that they have ever known, even though they are in a very familiar location. Even though they are isolated, without parent or guardian to keep them safe. Everything that they have known before no longer is, and the things that are familiar are no longer staying the same with an imminent threat that is looming, affecting them directly and indirectly, making the nightmare even worse. Now, suffice it to say, this movie isn't for everybody. It's not that it's that overtly terrifying, 
But because there are slower shots and there isn't exactly a end-all be-all conclusion, there are some people that genuinely just dislike it because it's not something that was made for them. But to those who are more enthusiasts of this type of liminal, quiet horror, it can be downright jarring, if not fucking triggering especially if you are somebody who had a turbulent or traumatic childhood. Something else that I did notice about the movie is that in some of the shots, it takes the things that are very common in liminal space imagery, and it sort of shows them from a different perspective, such as bedrooms and basements and living rooms. But instead of being directly head on with nobody in the shot, it's shot from completely obscure angles that go on for just a little too long. And even though a lot of liminal space imagery will have a distorted tone or an awkward colorization, this particular colorization being mostly in hues of black, blue, and gray invokes something that isn't quite right but it puts you as the person who is observing, not necessarily directly experiencing what's happening, but you yourself are powerless to change anything about the fates of what these children endure. Now, it's been a few minutes in the video since I brought up Hikati, but I figured now would be a good time to sort of break the tension. So I want to reference this book, Hikati, Liminal Rights by Sarita Deesta and David Rankine. And in this book, they go out of their way to point out, even dedicating an entire chapter to the fact that Hikati is also a goddess of dreams. Now, I'm just going to go ahead and read directly from the book, chapter 16, titled From Sleep. Dreams and nightmares were both attributed to Hikati, who could equally send nightmares to somebody who had offended her as good dreams to somebody who propitiated her. This may be seen in the Greek magical papyri, where the charm could be used either to reveal answers to questions during a sleep, aka dream oracle, or to cause somebody else to not sleep. The dream oracle was a function that Hikati shared with her mother, the goddess Asteria. Now I'm going to go ahead and read another portion in this chapter where they reference an actual historical precedent that places Hikati even in ancient times to be associated with sleep and dreams. A fragment from the 5th century BCE Greek poet Aeschylus, known as the father of tragedy, made reference to Hikati's influence in the realm of dreams. He stated, <clears throat> But either thou art frightened of a spectre beheld in sleep and hast joined the rebel route of Nether Hecate. This was clearly the popular view of this period, as Hippocrates also wrote in the 5th century BCE, If the patient is attended by fears, terrors, and madness in the night, jumps up out of his bed and flees outside, they call these the attacks of Hecate, or the onslaught of ghosts. Now, there is one last thing that I would like to read off from this book just to further and finalize my point. Later, Eusebius, recording Porphyry's writings, made this point in Preparatio Evangelica when he said of her, As ominous dreams thou dost to mortals send. When Eusebius quoted Porphyry in describing the procedure of creating a Hecate shrine, we find the line, then to my image offer many a prayer, and in thy sleep thou shalt behold me nigh. Now, even though what I read out of this book might make Hikati seem a little bit dreadful, it is important to point out that just as she can inspire or cause nightmares, she can also send pleasant dreams just as well. And honestly, it's just enough to make my point to draw a line between dreams and liminality and Hikati to say that dreams and liminality and Hikati are all of the same liminal in-between space that we call the margin of neither here nor there, and yet somehow both and neither.
DID is a weird disorder. Now, for those of you who are unaware, I'm the host of a DID system. And DID stands for Dissociative Identity Disorder. And it has shaped my entire worldview and my entire lived experience to some extent or another. Now, the thing that is most notable about DID or other system-bearing disorders such as OSDD-1A or OSDD-1B is multiple personalities. In fact, once upon a time, it used to be referred to as multiple personality disorder until a trained professional went in trying to disprove its existence and yet could not. However, the criteria for diagnostics was changed because the understanding of it was changed. Which is exactly how we were presented with the idea, the theory of structural dissociation, which is currently the leading clinical theory to explain how DID and other system-bearing disorders are formed. Now, the easiest cut and dry way that I can attempt to explain this is that when a child is experiencing repeated traumatic events, that child their brain will make them dissociate in order to get away from the situation. The problem is, this is happening during a time when a child's personality state isn't fully formed. So what winds up happening is, in order to forget these memories, the bad ones, there will be amnesia walls that are set up. But the unintended consequence that the brain doesn't quite rightly understand is that behind those amnesia walls, altered personality states of consciousness are formed. This is how one child develops into many different people. Now, I am not a professional. I am not a legitimate source of information on this topic. I am somebody with this disorder who has gone out of my way to try to understand the disorder that I am diagnosed with to the best of my ability. That being said, I preface this part of the video that way I can explain. My childhood memories are kind of fucked up. Now, before I go any further, I think it's fair to just give a general content warning, because I'm assuming that somewhere amidst my audience, there's at least one or two, maybe even more systems that view my content. I am not going to explain any of the trauma that I experienced or endured, but I am going to try to explain, in my own experience, how an amnesia-based disorder has affected my childhood memories. When I was a child, my mom would take me to a local mall. This mall is just a part of my childhood. It is a part of my earliest childhood memories. However, when I go down this particular memory lane, I start to realize that some of these memories are warped and distorted. Take, for example, when I was a child, there were two toy stores that were in this mall. One was KB Toy Works, and the other one was, well, I don't remember the name of it, but if I try to remember too hard, my brain starts to do a thing where it tries really hard to eject that memory. I'm not sure why, but that's a scab that I'm not willing to pick right here and right now. The point is to say, I thought that those toy stores were right next to each other in the mall. But that's not exactly how it was. And this happened again, because at this point in history, that mall also contained both a Sam Goody and a Suncoast. For those of you who don't remember that store, either of them, they were kind of like FYE and a hot topic. But that's still not really getting an exact replica or a frame of reference, but let's just work with that. I used to think that those stores were right next to each other, directly across from the TJ Maxx that used to exist in that mall. Come to find out, they were on completely opposite ends of the mall from one another. There also was a Planet Hollywood where, for the life of me, my mother 
tried to tell me that there was never a Planet Hollywood that existed in that mall until I finally had access to the internet and I could prove it because I remembered very distinctly a life-size replica of the Terminator in robot form standing in front of this restaurant. Now, the thing about it was, I was a little bit wrong because it was on totally the wrong side of the mall. Which means, although I remembered the planet Hollywood, I completely forgot where it was in conjunction to the layout of the mall. Now, there's another memory that I have that is probably one of the most distorted in relation to this mall. Where we had just left the toy store that I mentioned previously, and... I was sitting there, I had opened it, and I'm playing with it, and it was a Transformer toy, or a Transmetal Beast Wars more specifically. And I'm trying to change it from the ram shape that it was in to the robot shape. And I'm looking up, and I see a pizza place directly ahead of us. And then I look up and I ask my mom, hey, can we get some pizza? And my mom says, yeah, of course, absolutely. And then we continue to pass the, the pizza place that I saw. And I'm very confused as to why we're passing the pizza place when my mom said yes to pizza. Just to get to the far end of the mall, and there was a pizza place there. Long story short, I don't think that this memory actually took place. I think it was multiple memories that sort of weaved themselves together somehow. And my recollection of it is incredibly distorted. So when I'm talking about liminality and nostalgia and how it can be a little spooky, my memories have implanted malls and liminal spaces to be specifically spooky and yet at the same time a source of comfort. Now let's put it this way. That mall is so integral to the formation of my personhood that I have had several dreams where I am in this mall at night and there's almost nobody there but the lights are dim it's mostly empty and it is a little off it's off kilter it's off putting and it is exactly the long-winded mess of fabricated memories and liminal dream nonsense that you could possibly imagine. Now, another interesting byproduct of this disorder, this dissociative identity disorder that I have and deal with, it affects the way that I remember my childhood, which means it affects my sense of self. Because my sense of no childhood nostalgia doesn't always look exactly the way that it does to other people who are of my age. I've said before that oftentimes it feels as if I am a Frankenstein's millennial because the things that other people from the 90s recall in fondness make me incredibly uncomfy and unsettled. Not too long ago in history, and it's still a thing in some spaces today, is this incredible nostalgia for the 90s, where individuals are celebrating their memories of Rugrats and Ah! Real Monsters and Rocco's Modern Life and things like that. And I am so uncomfy with these things. I avoid them. I can't relate to people in my age range on these things. But the things that I can relate to with people of my age range are the things that did bring me comfort. Some of my first memories as an individual personality state of consciousness is watching Power Rangers Lost Galaxy while sitting there playing my Game Boy Advance, playing Pokemon Silver. And on top of that, I was finally getting into anime. Just like many people, Dragon Ball Z is a huge influence on my life because it was one of the anime that I was able to watch when I get home from school, turn on Cartoon Network, and there it is. Sailor Moon, Dragon Ball Z, Gundam Wing, or sometimes it was G Gundam or 8th MS Team. 
And then there were other things like Cyborg 009, which I only vaguely remember. And then there's also Big O, which I remember with incredible fondness and even own the entire thing on DVD now, and have yet to go back and pop in and go back down that memory lane, even though I own it. Now this is also why anime like Cowboy Bebop and Outlaw Star are incredibly important to me because as I got a little bit older and started figuring out a little bit more about myself and I was able to stay up later and watch the late night block of Toonami, Outlaw Star and Cowboy Bebop were right there and I drew a sense of comfort and a sense of understanding the world around me in a world that made no sense by watching fucking anime. But one of the reasons that I would wind up being up quite that late was because I am an insomniac. I suffered with insomnia as a kid and I suffer with insomnia as an adult. That type of trauma has affected me in so many ways that it's just a part of who I am now and not getting a restful night's sleep is a part of that and dealing with nightmares and the things that are scary, the things that are uncanny, is just a part of who I am as a person. But this is also why I turned it to magic. The first horror movie that truly traumatized me was The Ring, believe it or not, as simple or silly as it might sound, but it had an incredible PR hype about it. And when I finally sat down to watch it, I was not prepared because I had seen things exactly like that in my nightmares but on a dare the next morning instead of punking out and running away from it I sat down and finished it with my cousin the next morning and I became afraid of my own shadow I became afraid for a good six to eight month stretch that the little girl was going to climb out of my fucking mirror and get me when my back was turned, standing at the toilet. So I started peeing from the side of the toilet. So I could go ahead and keep an eye on the fucking mirror. Then, finally, one day, in the summer that I was aged 12, it was on. It was Stars or HBO or something like that. One of the movie networks. And I sat down and watched it. I faced my fears, and by the end of the movie, the hold that it had on me had completely vanished. So I thought to myself, what other things are there in my life that I could do this with? I found a way to lucid dream, some way, somehow, I don't know how, that way I could confront my nightmares and tell them that they are nightmares. I was no longer afraid of ghosts. Instead, I wanted to learn about them so I could relinquish the fear I had of them, which is when I started learning about paranormal investigation and started wanting to learn how to do spirit communication, which granted me an interest in Ouija boards and tarot and pendulum. I also, having been raised as a Christian child with a lot of Irish Catholic influence, I decided I wanted to learn about the devil, because if I could learn all there was about him, then there would be no reason for me to be afraid of him. And I started doing the same with all of the demons, his cohort of minions and co-conspirators. That way I could overcome my fear of them by learning about them, by coming to understand them. And this is how confronting my fears and my trauma helped me to embrace and find comfort in the things that were spooky and terrifying. Now, if I allowed myself, I could definitely get into the throes of a long-winded rant about my journey into spirituality and eventually magic, witchcraft, and paganism, but that's not what this particular video is about. I'm using that as a segue into explaining how magic itself is entirely liminal. Magic for me started off as a way for me to be able to face my fears and take hold of my own agency. 
It wasn't necessarily a way to accumulate power, more so learning how magical and mystical things worked, that way I could keep myself safe. However, as the years rolled on, it would become my greatest obsession. The topic of ghosts would soon be upgraded into necromancy, and spirit communication would evolve into outright channeling different divine beings. A year's long practice and meditation would suddenly transform into an effort in altered states of consciousness and realm travel. One day I realized that it had been a long time since I'd departed from the normal mundane world, and some time had passed since I had last visited. Something happened. The process had changed me into something that I never thought I could be before, and I was left with one sinking question. What had I become? Now, before I get too carried away, allow me to try and rein myself in, because I realize that the first portion of this video is framed much like a video essay where I'm talking about liminality, and now we're talking about magic. And with that being said, I need to remember that not everybody who's viewing this is part and parcel to the witchy and occult community. So let's talk about what I mean when I'm saying magic. Now, when I'm talking about magic, I'm referring mostly to the brand of Western witchcraft and occultism that mostly got a huge start in the mid-1800s and really caught traction around the 1800s going on into the 1900s, where at some point it started off with spiritualism and Ouija boards and scam artists trying to communicate with people who were allegedly deceased, and those people were using grief as a way to make money from the people who were grieving those loved ones. And then around the same time, we also have other orders cropping up, such as the Ordo Templo Orientis, as well as the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And then I want to give note to the three, four parents of modern occultism and magic, which I identify as Helena Blavatsky with her particular Theosophic Society, Aleister Crowley, love him or hate him, with his particular brand of Philema, and Gerald Gardner with his original initiatory Wicca. Now, with those things set in place and set in motion, gaining momentum, we also have to take the time to include the generalized neo-pagan movement, which, at least at the outset, was an attempt to look at the pre-colonial European cultures and the magics that they practice that was partly reconstruction, but mostly revision, and a lot of this circles around generalized witchcraft, as well as Celtic paganism and Norse paganism. This is also how we have the general idea set forth today that we call modern or contemporary witchcraft, which is a product of everything that I stated so far, and the accurate reconstruction, as well as the misrepresented revisions of the things that took place. And it's important to note here, not all magic is witchcraft. And just because it looks like witchcraft doesn't mean it's witchcraft. Oh boy, I just got started. Because you see, what we call witchcraft today looks more like or resembles more so general eclectic European folk traditions that would not have ever called anything that they do witchcraft because witchcraft was its own generalized brand of thing that was something that was a more akin to bad religion or nefarious practice. And then Christianity took that in order to villainize a whole bunch of different folk practices, which is why we look back into the past day and still think that some of this shit is witchcraft when it was actually just generalized folk or commoner's magic. 
Moving further from there, just because it's magic doesn't mean that it's witchcraft, because there are plenty of things that even in a contemporary setting that we would consider it to be witchcraft, it is actually ceremonial magic, ritual magic, high magic, some other form of occultism altogether that has nothing at all whatsoever to do with any kind of witchcraft in any way, shape, or form before the recent esoteric and rebranded, repackaged, if not downright appropriated cultural practices of a myriad of other different traditions that continue to perpetuate the misunderstanding, which is why nobody can agree on what magic or witchcraft actually is. So to answer this, I came up with a definition that although I came up with it all on my own to answer what is magic, I think it's something that most practitioners can at least mostly agree on. My personal definition of magic that I hope is mostly, if not all-encompassing, is stated as such. Magic is the bringing together of several different tools and or implements for the sake of changing the outcome of external events by altering both internal as well as external stimulus or conditions for the express purpose to change, transform, or otherwise alter the outcomes of events, actions, or deeds, both spiritual and physical, in accordance with the will of of the caster's individual desire. And that was a fucking mouthful. But a mouthful is what is required to try and take care of all of my bases. Another way to look at it would sound a little like magic is the manipulation of things known in order to bring about changes in the world of the unknown to have consequences in the world that is known. We are reaching from this world into another to bring about a change into this world. Which already starts off in some liminal adjacent explanation. And then furthermore, what you call yourself as a practitioner typically is going to be based on the school of thought or the magical system or the generalized belief structure in which you utilize to approach your magic. And that's going to determine whether you call yourself a witch, a magician, a sorcerer, or something at all like that. And it is in all of these areas where given enough time and research, eventually you will come across the name Hecate. was taking Garfield comics and contorting them into... Oh, that, that. It's next morning. Tantalizingly... <laughs> The sheer I need some fucking coffee. And now that I have successfully kickstarted my heart, my brain, and my colon with a delicious roasted bean water elixir, let's talk about Hikati. Now, before somebody tries to at me in the comments, Hikati's name has been introduced to multiple different regions, multiple different cultures, and has been introduced to many different tongues and languages. There are so many different ways to say her name that are all entirely and incredibly valid, and if we want to get incredibly technical about it, the proper way to say her name sounds something a little bit more like Akati. And since almost none of us are doing that, shush. I'm saying Hikati. Hecate is a goddess that doesn't have a whole lot of her own mythos. She winds up being adjacent to or a supporting role in other deities' myths, such as her involvement in the Homeric Hymn to Demeter, where she tells Demeter that Persephone has been abducted and then assists Persephone later on her way up to the surface. In many different regions, but notably in Athens, she was a protector of the home, particularly of women and children, and travelers while they were away from home. Something that a lot of my contemporary reconstructionists and otherwise peers in the working with and worship of Hecate either are unaware of or fail to mention is that worship of these deities in ancient Greece was very regional. People didn't do it in the same way in Thrace as they did it in Thessaly and sure as shit, Athens, although isn't exactly a monolith, did it in a very Athenian way. And we can see this in two notable examples that I can think of off the top of my head, which is her involvement in the Eleusinian Mysteries, where Demeter, Persephone, and Hecate are a part of this cultist worship that became later known as the Mystery Schools of Eleusis. 
I'm probably saying that wrong. I'm not sure if I ever knew how to say it properly. And the other notable example that I can think of off the top of my head is being the goddess of the witches of Thessaly. Now, we can see how she was at one point a goddess of protecting the wildlife, protecting people from the monsters in the night, as well as being a huntress that liked to wrestle bulls. Over time, she eventually became a part of a trio that included Selene, the moon herself, and Artemis, and Artemis, courtesy of her popularity and her already existing function as a goddess, wound up overtaking a lot of the things that Hikati was known for, such as being a huntress and protector of animals. And it is oftentimes Hakati, who is accredited for teaching the witches of Thessaly how to draw down the moon for the sake of magic, of which Selene herself in mythology was not happy with and often did so begrudgingly. And then everything changed when Alexander the Great attacked. <laughs> Hang on, let me collect myself. Before Alexander the Great, we have the Hellenic period, which is a notable time period where ancient Greek religion was at its greatest prominence until Alexander the Great came through and swept the area, making his way all the way to Egypt, declaring Alexandria as a new establishment for his empire. And that is the beginning of the Hellenistic period, a time in which trade was opened everywhere from Egypt crossing into Mesopotamia and even further into other regions. Courtesy of this expansive establishment of trade and commerce, there was now an exchanging of cultures going across Mesopotamia to Rome to Greece to the Middle East to Egypt and all of these cultures kind of got thrown together shake it up into the Hellenistic jar and shat back out. And this is how we have a lot of the different conflations that are popular and notable today, such as Hermanubis, Amun-Ra, the conflation between Artemis, Hecate, and Diana. I just And everything kind of just changed and is difficult to sparse through if not impossible to actually get a clear understanding looking at this point in history and trying to understand what happened all the way back then. However, the popularity of Hakati reached an all-time high, being already established as a goddess of travelers, wanderers, vagabonds, adventurers, if you will. People would oftentimes see the uh, effigies of Hakati at the crossroads and realized that there was benefit to asking for her favor or leaving offering on your travels. And a lot of the worship of Hikati got spread far and wide because people were seeing results when they included her as a goddess that they worshipped. An example of Hikati's incredible popularity during this time, I'm going to refer to the Greek magical papyri, which was probably actually just some dude's personal grimoire. Somebody who wanted to do magic who lived during the Hellenistic period, writing down all of his own spells and references to all of the magic that he was aware of and had worked. And God, I am doing a disservice by assuming that this individual was male. She even had an inclusion in early Gnostic Christianity as an aspect of Sophia, who was the lowest form of her, effectively placing her as the queen of hell, having command and dominion over all of the demons. She even was relevant during an early Christian era because she was so popular amongst common people and everyday individuals that she was effectively now a proto-saint in early Christianity. And let's not forget that Christianity at some point also did grant us a Mother Mary who was a protector of pirates and knew her way around handling a sword. I'm going to just leave that there and let's try to move on. Long story short, even in antiquity, there isn't a thing that Hikati wasn't known for or couldn't do. And yet that would begin to change when Hikati was resurrected in neo-paganism. 
In the early days of what we can now call modern witchcraft, there really wasn't a connection to the old ways, if you will. A lot of this had to do with a reconstruction based on a revisionist history, of which a lot of that was undue disrespect and fabricating incredibly heinous things onto the church, and although they are not innocent in history, some of the things have been made up to justify the existence and the resurgence of witches, and they still didn't want to be associated with Gerald Gardner or Wicca, so they wound up finding other different deities, oftentimes either in Norse paganism, Celtic paganism, sometimes something else entirely, and then rising up in the ranks came Hakati the goddess of witches and witchcraft. Now, like I said, there wasn't much of a lot of a genuine connection to the old ways. <laughs> Am I gonna leave that in? Yeah, it was funny. <laughs> there wasn't much of a genuine connection in modern witchcraft to the old ways, at least in the 50s and 60s. So when they found Hikati, they started attributing her to and likening her to some of the other popular goddesses, many of them fitting under the umbrella of the dark goddess archetype. And in some instances, all of these dark goddesses became conflated as one and the same dark goddess, but even in instances where this wasn't the case, we still had popular conflations between Hecate and Areshkigal, the Mesopotamian goddess of the underworld between Hecate and Lilith. I'm not touching that one with a 10-foot pole. That'll be waiting for another day if that day ever comes. Some instances, and the one that I find to be the most prevalent and persistent even to today, is the conflation between Hecate and the Morrigan. Because you see, we wind up seeing an image like this often for Hikati, where she is depicted with three faces and or three bodies looking in three different directions. However, that depiction has nothing to do with the Morrigan. That's a completely different culture and a completely different time period altogether. What it does have everything to do with is the three-way crossroads where Hikati's effigies would often be placed. Three-way crossroads. Three faces of one goddess looking in either direction, and eventually this evolved to help her be the goddess of travelers, wanderers, and vagabonds, because she can see down all of these paths in ways that normal, mere mortals cannot. And then this also evolved into Kothai, the spinner of fate epithet. Or I guess you could say aspect, if you're not familiar with the exact definition of epithet. The Kothai aspect... The spinner of fate, because not only is it physical roads that she can see, it is the past, present, and future, and can help you find the path in your own fate that you should be going down, which is why sometimes the destination isn't the objective, but the journey is, because you might not wind up exactly where you thought you would be, but it's exactly where you need to be when Hikati is on the job. Even in spite of this, today she is often referred to as being the goddess of witchcraft. And although this is accurate, that's not all she is. And if you view her through that lens, that's going to be very limiting for you and for Hakati. Because she isn't only the goddess of witches, she is the goddess of all forms of of magic, and if we want to play it safe, she is the goddess of all forms of Western magic. Even though there are so many different takes and interpretations and opinions on Hikati in today's contemporary witchcraft and occult circles, even so far as including her as an honorary member of the Infernal Empire, I don't think this is necessarily a bad thing. Because of the way that Hikati has been worshipped and revered in recent years, she has now become one of, if not the most prolific, popular, and domineering deities in all of existence. And as somebody who loves and adores this goddess, 
I think that is a really good and really cool thing because now she can be out there helping more people in ways that no other deity can. Problems wind up happening when we wind up accidentally or deliberately omitting things that are a part of her history, part of her roots, part of her origins, part of the culture that she came from. But even when some people do that, it winds up being well-intended, but still misses the mark entirely. In order to make my point here, I want to bring up a conversation that I've been privy to that took place a couple of years ago, but it all surrounds this emblem here. A lot of people know this as Hecate's Wheel. More accurately, it is known as the Strophilos. And at some point, Reconstructionists, a couple of them that I'm aware of, wound up pointing out that this insignia was found on a button excavated from the Mycenaean era of Greece. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar, ancient Greece is Hellenic Greece. Before that, there was a dark period, and before that, there was Mycenae. There isn't a whole lot known about Mycenae, and the thing about it is there's not nearly enough information or evidence to conclude anything about the way that life happened in Mycenae, the way that people worshipped deities, or for that matter, what deities were actually present then. There's not a lot known about Mycenae, and anybody that says so is misinformed at best or disingenuous at worst. But in spite of that, we did wind up in archaeology finding a button that had that insignia on it. The problem is that some of the individuals that were bringing this up were then inserting that this insignia, this Strophilos, being associated with Hakati, was just a part of modern witchcraft and neo-paganism. But that's not accurate either, because even in ancient Greece, there were people that were using the Strophilos in magic, in association with Hakati. And although it has been used in conjunction with Hermes and Apollo and some of the other deities, it is most prominently and most abundantly evident that it was associated with Hecate. So just because it came from a Mycenaean button doesn't mean that utilizing it doesn't have merit or value. Especially when we overlook the fact that Hellenic Greece was more or less a confederation of city-states united together under one religion and the Hellenic bad banner, metaphorically. And ancient Greek religion isn't a monolith. We cannot look at Athenian sources, which are the most popular sources, when we wind up using references in modern and contemporary recreation of ancient Greek religion. But if it represents Athens, that doesn't mean that it represents Thessaly. It doesn't mean that it represents Thrace. It doesn't mean that it represents any other place other than Athens. In other words, ancient Greek religion and the worship of these gods was never a monolith. And it was different depending on where you were. And it was very regional, and what was accurate over here may have been completely inaccurate over here. And that needs to be stated. I think we need to point out that just because it's pre-Christian doesn't mean it's better. And also, just because it is religiously attested to doesn't make it any more or less valid than something else that has also been a part of folk tradition or family tradition or regional religious cultist worship. But I think personally that so long as we are not deliberately erasing cultural, historical, or religious context, keeping in mind that two things can be true simultaneously, even if contradictory, there's nothing wrong with the modern and contemporary way that 
Hakati is worshipped and revered. Especially since we don't fucking know where she came from. Of course they're doing construction when I'm trying to film. Do we risk it? I think we risk it. Let's look at one of the earliest conclusions of Hakati in Greek myth. The Hesiod's Theogony. Where there is a 44 line hymn about how Hecate basically is the absolute shit. Because Zeus, in spite of all of his Zeusiness, has no qualm with Hecate, even granting her the epithet, the aspect of Kurotrophe, midwife. Well, direct translation is nurse of the young. But we would refer to it now as midwife. And even though she is a titan goddess from the generation before the Olympians, existing before the Titanomachy, which is what a good portion of the Theogony is about, she still has a portion of, oh hi, it's quieter. Hakati still has a portion of the earth, the sky, and the sea. Specifically, a portion of the earth where spirits and the unrest dead wander. Specifically, the portion of the sea that bears no fruit and is barren, and specifically the portion of the sky referred to as midheaven, just above the horizon, and not quite all the way up at the top. Midheaven is also the portion of the sky where the first light of the sun breaks from the horizon before the sun has actually risen, and is also where the last light of the sun perishes as it sinks beneath the horizon. All of these portions that are granted to Hikati, once again, are liminal in-between spaces that are a part of the dominion of all three kings of the cosmos, ruling all three realms, which places her in an incredible place of prominence and importance. And Hikati has pre-Hellenic worship in Anatolia, which although it was a part of ancient Greece, it currently is a part of modern-day Turkey, which is where Hesiod was also from. Now, in Anatolia, there is currently a temple to Hecate that is and has been for a few years now being excavated and restored, where it depicts Hecate delivering Zeus when Rhea was giving birth. Makes a lot of sense as to the whole Zeus insisting that Hecate would take the epithet of Korotrophe or Korotropos. But this makes me ask the question, did Hecate deliver all six of the children of Kronos and Rhea? So in the mythological canon, Hecate is a titan goddess who was a part of the divine rule before the Olympians took over. And in historical understanding, she has pre-Hellenic roots in Anatolia. But the situation becomes even more worthy of scratching one's head when we realize she might not even be from Anatolia and may have actually originated from somewhere further out east. Some have concluded that she might have an origin in Mesopotamia, where she was a lesser goddess that was more of a healer and more of a local goddess that people would worship. But this isn't necessarily entirely conclusive, because even though there are some artifacts and some archaeological suggestions that Hecate can be traced to Mesopotamia, we don't know if this isn't just the product of Hecate being conflated and syncretized with another goddess that fits this description who did exist in Mesopotamia. All this means is we don't know exactly where Hecate came from, but she existed before ancient Greek religion. And everything that I've said in this portion of this video points out that Pretty much everything Hikati is about is something directly or tangentially associated with liminality. And even without having a properly understood origin, she still gets to be liminally ambiguous. She really is the goddess of liminality.
This is the third day that I've worn this shirt for the sake of filming. And I wish that I could tell you that it and myself are clean, but quite frankly at this point, I fear that I would be lying to you. And this is officially the second day that I have woken up asking myself the question, have I said too much? Shortly followed by the question, who's going to still be here at this point in the video? And to that answer, all I have to say is, I have no fucking clue. But I am going to finish this video, goddammit, for the same reason that I chose to not include 30 minutes worth of unedited footage that I filmed yesterday. For the same reason that I am wondering whether or not these underwear are salvageable. It's because I've left myself with no other option. And I don't think I can forgive myself if I stopped now. At this point in the video, I have talked a lot. I've talked about liminality. I've shared personal stories. I have brought up some of the same points that a lot of other content creators have brought up in their own videos about liminality. That way, I could regurgitate some other information while at the same time rubbing my own stank on it and hopefully presenting something new. And that new thing was supposed to be magic and Hakati. That way I could profess that magic is a liminal experience and that Hakati is in fact that bitch. And I have utilized a lot of horror media as my jumping points. I have also shared a little bit about how my own childhood trauma has affected me and made me inherently and psychologically biased to seek these things out in order to find comfort. And it is in that that I am trying to convey a sense of liminality in this video here, because liminality is a feeling that I am very familiar with a feeling that I don't know if I have ever gone a day without feeling. I've also tried to posit that perhaps there is something psychological and nigh-universal that makes so many people go out of their way to seek out this feeling. And I think I finally figured it out. Liminality, that feeling, is a warning. It's a warning telling us that we are about to venture into the unknown. And the reason that we keep going for it is because we want to know what's on the other side. And liminality, by its definition, is something that we feel and something that takes place when we are in the process of a transformation or a transition from one state of being to another. So I think another thing that sometimes the horror elements of liminality winds up placating to or catering to is the fear of that transformation and no longer being the same as we were before because once we get to the other side we will know that there is no turning back and that is a scary feeling. And that is exactly why I have been wearing a Junji Ito shirt with the character Tomai. Tomie? I'm not 100% certain how to properly pronounce it. Let's say Tomai. Tomai is a graphic novel by the horror mangaka Junji Ito, where in the beginning, a young girl who is categorized as unnaturally beautiful is harmed, is killed, and defiled in unspeakable ways. So when she comes back to life with monstrous powers, her seeking revenge is understood and justified. Even if it is dark and macabre, it's something that can be understood by a number of people wanting to harm the people that have harmed you. But as Tomai goes along, she starts harming people that are like the people who hurt her. And we can still rationalize it. Harming people that are like the people that hurt us to stop them from hurting others. And yet, 
over the anthology of stories about Tomae, by the end, she's become a full-blown monster, no longer human, even succumbing to the acts of harming a child. And this, I feel, is the type of horror that liminality winds up conveying. When we are embarking on a liminal journey, we are departing from the world that we are familiar with, with a world that we are comfortable with, and with any luck, we will return to the world that we did once know. But by the end of it, we are changed, sometimes in miniature, minuscule ways, other times entirely drastically. And the entire experience between point A and Point B. We are undergoing some kind of transformation. These transformations are oftentimes related to rites of passage. This is where the definition as we contemporarily understand it comes from, which is why so many people wind up suggesting puberty as a universal example of a rite of passage that we're all familiar with or we're at least all warned about is something that's going to happen. But at the same time, it doesn't matter how much you're prepared for it, how much you're informed about it. You can be just as, if not better prepared for whatever adventure you're about to go on. It's still going to be different than you thought it was going to be once you are in the process of experiencing it. A lot of liminal horror or liminal suspense winds up alluding to or playing at our own feelings of dread when we are feeling this experience of liminality. Not being able to return to the way that things were before, but at the same time being stuck in a situation that might be incredibly unfortunate or incredibly dreadful or downright terrifying and we are stuck there, in that situation, with no way back and no perceived way of finding a way out, not knowing when it's going to end and just hoping and praying and holding on to any semblance of sanity that we have left because we don't know when the ride is going to be over. I think there is a reason why the slasher horror character of Freddy Krueger is somehow still an incredibly memorable and impactful horror character to this day. We can sit there as adults and watch these movies and call out the camp and the silliness and make fun of the tropes that are included in the Night Nightmare on Elm Street series. But what it does is it plays at this idea that when we are asleep, we are vulnerable. And when we are dreaming, we're not really in control of those dreams. So what happens when there is a monster that was once human, who when they were alive did terrible unspeakable things, now as a process of their death or some deal that they made with some paranormal entity, they now have the power to continue to wreak that same kind of fear and havoc and terror onto people when they are at their most vulnerable, in situations that they have no control over, and they don't know when the dream is going to end, and they don't know when they're going to wake up from the nightmare. But if they don't, the things that they endure in the dream are going to have lasting physical impressions. And if you don't find a way out of it, or a way to wake up from the nightmare, or a way to take hold of the dream that you're suffering, then it very much might cost you your life. Being a part of the Witch Talk community, there is something that took place a few months before my filming this that I want to talk about here. There was an individual who practices a type of divination known as osteomancy, aka bone throwing. Typically, this is throwing some chicken bones in order to get a yes or no answer based on the questions that you are asking. Now, this person is a skilled and reputable practitioner who has been practicing their craft for the better part of two decades, if I'm recalling correctly. 
for all intents and purposes, they know what they're doing, and their approach is very practical and pragmatic. Then one day they are asked a question from the comments to take to the bones, if you will. That question was, are witches human? And surprising everybody, the answer was no. Now, I myself was not prepared for the conversations that were going to follow from that particular video. And a lot of people gave this practitioner an incredibly unfair backlash that I don't think was warranted or necessary at all. I myself even took that as an example to remind everybody that sometimes divination can wind up seeming pretty faulty and it can give us answers that we didn't expect, which is why it's important to always second guess and maybe... This is why we should have follow-up questions or wonder about the context in which the answer is coming from. But regardless, I think it's worth noting here that in some instances, witches very much are not human. Courtesy of this revisionist history that is a part of neo-paganism and modern witchcraft, the definition of witch is somebody who practices the craft of a witch, and dedicates themselves to that, and commits to being a witch. However, this is fair and fine and valid and accurate to say and suggest, but it is also just as important to note that this isn't always the way that witches were received. Now, before I get into it, I want to preface this by saying, the witch trials were never about witches. The witch trials were an excuse to do away with the people that the communities in those areas deemed as unwanted and undesirable. And by accusing them of being a witch is how they justified killing off a whole bunch of people. Witches were never the problem. Witches were the excuse. And the Christian Catholic religion was the vehicle through which they got it done. And the reason that calling people witches was so successful in getting rid of people once they were accused is because even before Christianity, witches were the monsters of folklore. Witches in this folkloric context are people that started off as human that practiced magic of some sort and either became solitary in order to practice some kind of nefarious magic, or they were excommunicated because they broke the vows of their tradition or of their culture. And in that excommunication, they wound up continuing on with that practice that was considered irredeemable. There are other instances where a regular, normal human person would go and make a pact with some kind of other monster or a more powerful witch or, later on, some kind of devil. And it was through this pact, this bond, this deal, that they were able to derive their powers. But for whatever reason, these types of witches got their power, either by utilizing that power or by utilizing the power that was bestowed unto them, they became either more than or less than human. The more that they were practicing this magic, the more twisted and contorted they would become until they were no longer recognizable as human, because for all intents and purposes, they no longer were. And for this reason and several others is why I don't think that the backlash that particular osteomancer received was justified or fair. Because sometimes there is context, whether it is known or understood or not, that makes sense of the answer that is received. Suffice it to say, the witches of yesteryear looked nothing like and probably didn't practice anything that resembled what the witches of today are doing. So when we look at forms of Hollywood representations or in fantasy media, this understanding of the monstrous witch doesn't come from the lived experiences of witches today. It comes from the very real and the very valid 
folklore of the more ancient cultural traditions. And I think there's a way that this more folkloric fairy tale type of witch winds up invoking a type of fear in us. It's not too different from the way that Freddy Krueger invokes fear. It's because they were once human, and we are human. And if we're not careful while doing things such as practicing magic, then maybe we might wind up looking more like them than we want to admit. Before moving on to the next point, I want to bring up my personal definition of magic once again, as well as the definition of liminality as I explained it before. First, my definition of magic. Magic is the bringing together of several different tools and or implements for the sake of changing the outcome of external events by altering both internal as well as external stimulus or conditions for the express purpose to change, transform, or otherwise alter the outcomes of events, actions, or deeds, both spiritual and physical, in accordance with the will of the caster's individual desire. And then for the previously stated definition of liminality. From the Latin limen or threshold, the quality of disorientation from the ambiguity that occurs in the middle stages of a rite of passage. Now, I want to point out that inclusion, that liminality comes from limen, which is the threshold or the margin. This is the in-between space where it is yet to become the thing it is going to be, and it is no longer the thing that it was before. And Hikati, once again, is the goddess of thresholds. There would be, and still are, places that are thresholds, doorways, windows, mirrors, portals, even at the gateways. Hikati has an epithet, propalaya, which means before the gate or gatekeeper. Positioning her as a gatekeeper of mystical, spiritual, and occult types of information. She is the one standing at this threshold, the limit between the mundane world and the magical world. And when we are practicing magic, we are doing something in the physical world that brings about a change across that threshold into the magical world that then comes back over to impact the physical world. Or say you are somebody who practices astral projection. You are sitting in meditation in your physical body and projecting some part of your mind, your consciousness, across that threshold into some kind of unseen realm in order to do something spiritual or interact with something spiritual. Or say you are a practicing medium. You are now using yourself as the threshold between the seen and unseen worlds. Whatever it is we're doing, we wind up interacting across that threshold. And at first, these things can be scary, jarring, even making us feel as if we're downright crazy. But what happens when we get used to it and we get better practiced and we're desensitized to that uncomfy, liminal, horror type of feeling? We push the threshold further. And if we're not pressing the threshold further, then we are getting more comfortable going further past that threshold. In my personal opinion, Magic is a practice that is a concerted effort in exploring and oftentimes manipulating the things that are unknown. It's an exploration of the things that are just outside of the normal purview of what constitutes as normal and rational. And the more we get further away from it, the more we wind up meeting situations in which we need to overcome. We wind up cultivating skills that now set us further apart from the normal mundane world. And even if we can normalize this for ourselves, even if we can rationalize this for ourselves, the process is 
transformative. And with any luck, people will be able to take breaks and get grounded back into the mundane world and physical reality and not get too detached from the physical world. Because this is exactly where people are starting to talk about spiritual psychosis. And although I am going to say it's probably a good thing that we're talking about spiritual psychosis, I'm not sure if all of the conversations being handled surrounding spiritual psychosis is entirely fair, or if in some cases it's just an excuse to continue othering those who have a different experience and therefore look entirely too different to be accepted into the popular society, if you will. And it's not to say that there isn't a concern or a threat going on here. In fact, it is not difficult to get detached from the regular, normal, physical world when you are dedicating your entire life to a magical way of thinking and doing things. But this is also why we are encouraged when we start out to practice grounding, to take regular breaks, to do something or set aside time and space for us to do something that is not magical. This is why we are encouraged to learn protections and banishings and cleansings and all of the different types of safety precautions for the maintenance of spiritual as well as physical and mental health. Because when you don't take these things into account and you're not taking the time for these things, you can get very detached. And even if you are taking the time to stay grounded and stay centered and to stay safe and to practice mindfully, the more you go adventuring into what is the unknown, that which we call magic, we eventually get to a point where we look back and realize how far we've come and maybe sometimes we have that moment of self-realization where we look in the goddamn mirror and ask ourselves, what have I become? And this is why magic is incredibly liminal and is also entirely fucking terrifying. And in spite of this, if you are a magical practitioner, odds are there's a chance that you do the magic, and then you see the results, not just in your personal self and your own internal life, but in the life around you. There are good and bad things that are coming from this. There are results being yielded, and in the very least to yourself, you can say, hey, this shit is real, and this shit is w working. Here's my proof, and even if you don't believe me, it's proof enough for me. It's still transformative, and it's still a departure from the normal world. It's still leaving the world of what is comfortable and known, the world of the comfortable and the rational. It steers away from what is generally upheld as the safe and sound way of living one's life. And when you get acclimated to this, when you get accustomed to it, when you get proficient in your skills and confident, and this is just a part of your life now, you can't unlearn what you have learned. You can't undo what you have done. And to some extent, you can rationalize it and talk yourself down and maybe have to consider the idea that maybe I am just a little bit off my fucking rocker. But on a long enough timeline, practicing any form of magic is an exercise in madness and an exercise that shows results. And those results are because it's transformative. So maybe we aren't the witches of yesteryear, nor are we the monsters of folklore, nor is being a witch going to turn us into something that is less than or more than human. But how long is it going to take before you stop recognizing your own reflection and being left with the stark reality 
that you can't take it back and you can't undo it. What will you then do? Feeling that moment of dread and terror, do you shut it down and turn tail and run back the other direction? Or do you take a break and hope that things normalize and even out? Whatever the case is, this shit can be scary. Especially when you're practicing without taking heed to the warnings of others. For the most part, magic is a deeply personal and individual thing. Even if you are a part of a community or a coven or an order or some kind of tradition where you have support of people around you, as well as a praxis where the path is laid out for you, it still hinges on the personal, direct, first-hand experience of the person who is practicing. And because magic entails working with things that are intangible and ineffable, the things that are unseen and cannot be quantified or proven and defies real explanation, it winds up being entirely subjective to the individual. Because let's face it, I don't think any of us actually know what we're doing. We're operating on a best guess based off of our own firsthand experiences as well as the experiences written about by the people that came before us. And I think this is what makes it spooky and uncanny. And this anxiety about it is part of what the appeal is. Because we can have a best guess but we don't know what's on the other side of that threshold and we don't know where the journey is going to take us and we don't know what's going to cross our path along the way. And that feels exactly like the same type of liminal, uncanny uneasiness that everybody else has been talking about in these liminality videos. All right, I'm supposed to tie off this video because I've been at this for three fucking days and quite frankly it's a lot that I've had to cover and I've also tried to deliver it in such a way that it would bring about the feeling of liminality which was part of why I started off with a story and then also included a little bit about my own disorder and how that has affected me and why I'm sort of drawn to these different things and, good God, I could go ahead and bring up the point that almost every other video on this topic has brought up, and that is, nothing has been the same since COVID-19 swept the globe. But I don't know if I have the wherewithal, the depth, or the brevity to cover that particular topic. But I am proficient in pattern recognition. So what if I just go ahead and say, people have been getting into liminality, liminal space imagery, and magic all at the same time. I think interesting because when everybody went on lockdown, everything changed and nothing has been the same since. Everything changed. Everybody fled to TikTok. Everybody started having the real world thrust in their face in real time. And that is jarring. And because people were spending more time online because they had to stay home and social distance and make sure not to get ill, the amino compromised. It was very limiting in what we were able to do. So there we are, departing from everything that was normal, knowing somewhere within us that nothing was going to be the same, confined to little spaces, not knowing how we're going to get out, longing for a return to where we came from, knowing goddamn well that even if we were to replicate the way that things were before. It wouldn't fucking work. It would be a simulation of it. Just like the simulations that we find and we see in liminal space imagery. Because half of this shit is made with AI or some kind of digital art. 
and it's just a simulation, which means that everything that is a return to that feels uncanny and unnatural because it's like we're faking it. But had we been faking it the entire time, nobody knows what to do. And nobody knows where this is going. And as the days roll on, it feels more and more bleak. And maybe I am just in my own liminal feels. And the dread of not knowing where I'm going is getting to me and has been getting to me for a long time. I mean, I even made a video at the top of 2023 that was called My Liminal Hell, where I'm trying to artistically convey the feeling of liminality while I'm telling my story. But this was supposed to be not that. It was supposed to be bridging the gap between my interest in liminality and my interest in magic and witchcraft and how it's all part of the same conglomerate whole to myself. And I have no fucking clue at this point if that has been conveyed because I'm tired and I'm exhausted and I'm starting to feel a little bit of a delirium here and I don't know where this is going and I don't know quite frankly how to end it but maybe that's because this video has all been about liminality taking on the topics that others have talked about before in their own videos about liminality. And maybe it's because I made mention that Hikati is the goddess of liminality. And maybe sometimes liminality isn't what we think it is, but with liminality, we are able to evolve and change and grow, just like the conversations of liminality, just like the topic of Hikati, just like the experience of magic, whether you're talking about it and the community changes, or you are practicing and you yourself are changing while you're learning more and you're practicing more and you're doing things differently and you see the change. And now we are at a point where we can collectively look back and even the moment that we went on lockdown is a part of our nostalgia. Whether it be good nostalgia or bad nostalgia, it's in our memories. And I know that a whole part of why I made an hour and a half long video about Unus fucking Honest was because Unus Honest is a part of my COVID nostalgia. Because when everything was locked down, Ethan and Mark were right there. And it's ironic in some way that at the beginning of all of this mess, we had a publicity social experiment on YouTube constantly reminding us to remember death, remember that you will die, constantly staring ourselves in the face with our own mortality, constantly being reminded that someday we will die. It's like, good God, my cousin just got overtaken by the COVID. I fucking know, Marcus Plarkus. Good God. Maybe that's the point of this video, is there's not a good way of ending it. Because by its nature, liminality doesn't end. Because even when we depart from part A, and we've gone through the transformation and the metamorphosis, and we get to point B, at some point, point B will become the new point A, and that will become the new normal, and we will be adventuring forward to the next part B. And we'll be on a new journey of metamorphosis and transformation as we're having our liminal experiences. And I think that's why liminality doesn't end. It only pauses. And it only takes the time to take its breath because things are constantly changing and constantly evolving and there really is no end to it. And we don't know where it started. All we have is the last point A that at one point was a point B. God, this is all existential. And maybe that's why I'm feeling vulnerable in uploading this video. And why I'm convinced that by its length and by my lack of notoriety entering into the world of video essays and liminality that I'm bringing all of my kooky nonsense with me. 
Oh no, man. Maybe there's not a good way to end it. Maybe this is the ending. We are at a seven minute plus one take, one shot. And I think that's the way I'm going to end it. And on that note, if you are still here, thank you so much for listening and sticking with me on this journey and this adventure and this wild ride, whether it was for this video or you've been following since my early days on this platform or you came over because you were following me on TikTok. Oh, there's another good point. Point A was YouTube. Point B was TikTok. And I stayed on TikTok for a long time and then it became my new point a, and now I'm trying to go back to YouTube. So now my previous point A has become the new point B, and even though it's nice and cozy and comfy doing these videos again, maybe I'm also currently in the middle of my own liminal experience, coming to terms with the fact that YouTube just isn't what it was before, and in spite of that, I have changed, and so has the platform, and I am currently changing, and so is the platform, and it's going to change. And I'm just sitting here on my little island, finally back on YouTube, knowing within my heart that I can't undo what has been done, and I can't unlearn what I have learned. Oh my god. It doesn't fucking end, does it? All right, this is going on 10 minutes now. This whole one shot, one take has got, I'm, if you're still here, thank you for listening. And as always, take care and much love.